Right, so here, this is a, a, like, a little diagram uh, that I've done of uh, of the economy going through the 20th century, the 1900s, and then going up until about uh, 2016, 2017 sort of time. Um, 90, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, uh, the first thing, after the First World War, uh, um, uh, we, uh, uh, I, uh, this is a thing that um, I think is worth mentioning. I did see an article in the Daily Express, I think it was, where it made, uh, it seemed to make out that people got some very nice houses or something, you know, when they came back from the First World War. But I think actually the general opinion is, amongst most people, that the sad thing they were promised was a home fit for heroes. Now you've got the 1925, I think, general strike. I think you've got mass unemployment for British workers right there through the uh, 1920s. Um, I think you've got the Great Depression of the early 1930s and things only really started getting better after the Treaty of London, I think, in 1933. So I don't think that there really was a home fit for heroes. And I think to say that is really very, very sad because there's a lot of people who really suffered in that First World War. I think there were about 10 million dead soldiers. But the good thing about it, I suppose, was there weren't the massive civilian casualties that there were in the Second World War. So anyway, in 1923, we have a currency movement here. And that was that in 1921, the German Deutschmark was worth approximately seven Deutschmark to one United States American dollar. Now, I remember my aunt who worked, I think, maybe with Alan Turing during the Second World War and also worked as a teacher, blinking at the thought of this and all sitting around as a little boy or young chap listening to them going on about the fact that you needed wheelbarrows to carry your money around in. Now, what... Because what happened in 1923, this is where the wheelbarrows come in, uh, you, there's billions of Deutschmark uh, to the US dollar. That means something like, uh, and going up dramatically. I mean, they talk about mass incredible inflation, hyperinflation, I think they call it. Anyway, uh, the, incre uh, the inflation is so great, I think my aunt told me, and I'm sure this is absolutely nothing to do with, or under the Official Secrets Act, because, um, <laughs> you know, it was all over the news in the, um, you know, it was sort of, uh, I don't know, everybody really knew it, that, you know, if you got ordered a cup of coffee in Germany, you know, better to pay for it first, because by the time you got it, it could have shot up in price through uh, your week's wages or something ludicrous. I don't know the exact numbers, but, you know, it, it was a pretty dreadful time, if you can imagine it, if you work a whole week, if you don't get to spend your money quick, I mean, it's not encouraging people to keep money. I mean, because if you keep your wages, you know, uh, it's going to be uh, confetti very, very quickly, which is why there are so many billion dollar, billion Deutschmark notes around, and they don't cost a lot because there are so many of them. No, you know, you'd expect a billion pound note, for instance, you know, oh, well, there can't be that many, you know, well, at the moment, you know, but the thing is, is that... Um, you know, uh, this is what this is what it is. Uh, Churchill lost heavily in the Wall Street crash, 1929. We see that there. You know, we're going here for and um, and I found this out in a book about his wife, and uh, I'm I'm very embarrassed to say I've forgotten her name, uh, but I did only look at the book because I thought, well, if I look at a book about his wife, uh, you can probably find some information there that would get in. Uh, as opposed to actually looking at a book about Churchill himself, where perhaps some of the information might be uh, strange. Uh, Churchill lost heavily, badly injured in 1933 in a taxi crash. The point of talking about that is that he was so worried about the me medical bills, I mean, his wife... Um, uh, 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 had to go from the from the um, Waldorf Astoria 
point. Yeah, I mean, she just rushed out there, bare feet. It was a life and death situation, apparently. Um, of course, when Churchill was on Wall Street, um, uh, he was walking down Wall Street and he actually saw somebody come out of a window on Wall Street. Now, there is absolutely no doubt that Churchill would have, to my mind, that Churchill would have realised that as he was going through the same thing himself, uh, uh, bankruptcy, and losing all his cash on the Wall Street crash, cash on the Wall Street crash, uh, that uh, this um, was not some guy jumping out the window because he couldn't get a whiskey, and this was something to do with prohibition. I mean, that is just complete and utter the ludicrous, if anybody was to think that that's what it was. And then we got the blues music and the hobos. I mean, this is my interest really a lot, is in rock music and how it, you know, it came about and all that sort of thing. And uh, in 1933, we have the Treaty of London. Now, in my opinion, I think what the treaty, it was about currencies, and I think it was to do with stopping all this gambling on currencies. And, uh, the London Conference. It's mentioned in the, in my favourite little video. Now, unfortunately, around that time in 1933, Hitler came to power in Germany. Now, Mussolini was also coming to power in Italy. Now, there is a thing to say that, uh, that Mussolini was quite good because of the fact he disliked the Mafia. Well, actually, really, the way I look at it, really, I'm afraid Mussolini was another Mafia. He just got rid of the other Mafia gangs if he could. That's the way I look at him. And uh, as for Hitler, I see him exactly the same Mafia leader. No uh, worries about uh, people's human rights or individual rights or anything. And um, he comes to power and takes over and destroys all the things. And unfortunately, Germany at that time had the same voting system that we now have in this country. Uh, the United Kingdom, um, where uh, David Cameron, the Prime Minister, described it as a first-past-the-post system. Which it is not. It is simply the person who gets the first, the largest amount of votes wins. Now, on that election, apparently a lot of people said that Hitler, I think, got 10 million votes for the... No, 12 million votes for the um, Nazi party. These are rough figures. It gives an idea. Um, uh, the Christian Democrats got about 8 million and the, um, uh, the communists got about 6 million. Now, I think that the fear of the communists drove people to vote for the right-wing Hitler. Uh, Nazis. I, I think they saw it as safer, especially due to the fact there was a Soviet Union not too far away. They didn't like the idea of the communists. Uh, I don't think. Anyway, the middle party suffered. Um, how much of the newspapers were owned by, you know, uh, Adolf and all that, I don't know. And all that. It's a I only have very basic information, but it shows that, in fact, with that system, um, you've got it where sort of like 12 million Nazis, but you've got 8 million plus 6 million um, Christian Democrats or something and uh, communists. So there are actually 14. As a, he didn't get the majority, that's the point, but he did take over and destroy very, very, very quickly all the instruments of democracy. And in 1939, we had the Second World War. Now, we get back to the London Conference here. Now, what I'm saying is, I think you'll find that not just Germany had a world boom at this time. I think if the figures were looked at, and I haven't really looked at them that well myself, but I think actually you will find that all the countries in the world had a pretty swift recovery from the Great Depression after the London Conference of 1933. The only problem is, of course, at this time, Winston Churchill is shouting his head off, warning about war. And I think a lot of people thought he was just a bit of an empty, actually. Uh, but he recognized it, according to some program, but anyway, he, I think he recognized that um, the cult of leadership, 
the military, you know, the concentration on military power and all of that sort of thing, it looked like trouble. Anyway, 1939, you get the Second World War. And this is the really important video uh, that get, got me thinking. And it's the United News, Breton Woods, it's called. And for the moment, it's still on YouTube. And Allied, the Allied military, some would have seen as it was viewed in 1944, July, during the war. I mean, imagine that it would have been about the opening of the conference in July 1944, it would have been shown. And Bretton Woods, and I really recommend people to see that, just purely from a historical point of view. Bretton Woods Economic Conference for World Peace through Economic uh, um, Prosperity. I've got it wrong there, it's not stability. It's And on the first day, they are discussing the stability of currencies. I mean, if I can do it in a sort of voice like he did it. Here we are, Mad Washington, Bread on Woods. Uh, 44 Allied Nations, 70, 730, 730 delegates come here to discuss world peace through economic prosperity. And amongst other things, on the first day of the conference, they will be discussing the stability of currencies. Now, People sitting there at 18 or 19 years of age listening to that may very well, days later, have been facing Nazi bullets or Japanese kamikazes. Uh, I mean, when I say Japanese, I mean, this is like when they had their cult uh, uh, stuff going on and, you know, you can't blame anybody who was, like, born in Japan or Germany particularly. It's the way things were. It's very, very sad. Just in some ways that like, you can't... And then here come And so, anyway, that was in the... Ninth, uh, and then the war sort of came to an end. And then we got this sudden boom after the war. I mean, during the, uh, 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 during the war, we have... Um, uh, at the end of the war, we had 70 million dead. And I think the figures are that every day of that conference, some, something like, uh, for the whole war, I mean, something like 70,000 people a day are being killed. Okay, now that's a war, I think. You know, <laughs> it's getting pretty big. I mean, we might one day make it look like a small war. But at the moment, it is like, I think, the biggest war there's ever been. Unless maybe you go right the way back to um, sort of like uh, the Mongols or something. But yeah, they didn't, they didn't, they couldn't drop, uh, you know, nuclear weapons and, and have thousand bomber raids and all that business. So, well, you know, I've got tens of thousands of people being killed in a night, you know. So, uh, 1946, actually, Breton Woods. So it took two years for it to actually get ratified by all the Allied and Associate Nations. As it says in the video, the United News video, all, all agreement all agreements to be ratified by the Allied Associate Nations and their governments. Something like that. Uh, so we've got 45 million refugees just wandering around Europe. Now that does make it look very small. I mean, what the, uh, uh, the uh, German government has done by saving those 2 million people's lives, uh, I mean, it, it's not 45 million, you know. <laughs> you know, it's, it's 2 million. Um, and we had a devastated European cities and UK war debt was roughly equivalent to debt now in the UK. But by 1957, the UK had never had it so good and there was Macmillan and you had uh, an NHS, National Health System. You had Social Security, I think, for the first time. Um, you had a benefit system where the poorest in society uh, would be looked after. You had uh, free... Um, education for pretty well everybody, um, like primary, right the way through, free school milk, uh, you got free, uh, they could afford free university education for people, uh, and when you say free, that means you actually got paid to go to university, your books were paid for, your accommodation was paid for, and you got the, your fees paid for, and you had some money given you to spend as well. Um, uh, so, you know, it was very different to now. And I mean, following on from such an enormously uh, costly um, war, to have such an enormously fantastic recovery um, it, it is phenomenal. And it must be 
really that they basically they stopped people from investing all this money in gambling most uk war debt repaid i think by about 1970 that is the 1960s and they were a really good time for i mean in, in, from the point of view of being getting out of job i saw a program about a mod and he uh, managed to get 300 jobs in one year just go from one to another and i don't think they were zero hours contract jobs um, in the 70s, people were shocked about the fact that, you know, they went for an interview and they're like two or three hundred people going for the job. But I think now, and that, that you know, and those were proper jobs, not zero hours contract jobs. And nowadays, I think even for the zero hours contract jobs, you've got masses of people uh, turning up to look and see if they can get a job. Anyway, Nixon shock, then slowly but surely, we seem to get a growth. Uh, uh, Bretton Woods collapses. I think uh, Harold Wilson had something to do with it, I think, in the fact that he was told, if you want to get this cash, you know, to help your government, even though, in fact, Britain was doing really pretty well, really. <laughs> it's just we weren't doing quite as well as... The, well, Britain wasn't doing quite as well as its European neighbours, who had formed some European Union or something like that. Um, a wit and um, de Gaulle did not want Britain to join. I mean, this is all irrelevant, sorry. But, you know, anyway, uh, I think what it was, I remember this from the 1960s, I was a kid at the time, and I think that what basically happened, and I didn't understand it at the time at all, was if you want to have this cash, you've got to devalue your pound. Well, of course, devaluing the pound does upset the whole of the Bretton Woods system because the Bretton Woods system was so that you don't devalue currencies. You have stable currencies so that people can't gamble on them. And the reason for that, of course, is that if you've got a horse race and all horses come in first all the time or they all come in last all the time, you can't really gamble on them. So, you know, there's not the opportunities for being able to go out and nobble one of the horses <laughs> or uh, uh, misreport the results of the relay race or anything like that. Uh, so you think, and uh, A, and B, this money can be going into, um, uh, you know, it can be going into um, uh, jobs, nurses and things like that. And I think there's a very, very clever president of the United States who supported it at the um, Bretton Woods Agreement who said that really we need to be investing in people and jobs and doctors and scientists rather than really gamblers you know <laughs> you know I mean that's up to me that's what it is you know sorry um anyway uh you know not that not that all of it. I mean pensions all that stuff you know very very important you know but um you know this country does is still 850,000 million of it is coming from the productive industries, according to uh, the CEO of Siemens, uh, I think his name's Jürgen Meyer, on Question Time, where he said 850,000 million is coming from those guys. And if you look back at that, you can find it on the video. He actually says, you know, he does a list of things, you know. Anyway, here we go. Two trillion a day, the Forex now. Whoops. So uh, the, for, oh, the currency dealing industry, so slowly and got bigger and bigger. There's programs where we've got a gasp in the 80s because somebody had managed to earn 25,000 pounds on the Forex. Whoa, yeah. Now there's 25,000 pounds. <laughs> oh my, oh there's 25,000 pounds of this, uh, unfortunately. I mean, I must say this, 10 pounds is a lot of money for me. I'm not saying that it isn't, you know. Um, oh, I've got any of this money. And, uh, and uh, like 25,000 pounds, I mean, it wouldn't show up on the UK or national because I mean 25,000 pounds this is this is your footballer here at 90 million <laughs> so it has 35 grand gonna show up yeah maybe it'd be it wouldn't even be that dot that would be far too big anyway uh, so you know they were getting all excited about that in the 90s of course it got bigger and they made this very big boo-boo in the 90s in 1993 where between a quarter, approximately a quarter to three quarters of UK tax public expenditure Gone West in one day. Uh, and George, George Soros was, you know, celebrated as being the man who almost broke the Bank of England. And they were trying to stay in the European monetary mechanism. Not worth worrying about. It's all gone. That but basically, it meant that, you know, uh, people lost um, the equivalent of about 
between 250,000 million and 850,000 million in today's money. Described in the newspaper as, you know, because I think they realise people don't know what a, people don't know what a billion is. And it's a foreign language. It's a foreign language then. It's not a difficult foreign language because there's only two words really um, that we really need to worry too much about and that's billion and trillion because most people know million. Uh, but this foreign language is billion and trillion and billion is nine zeros or a thousand million. Please don't forget the commas after every three zeros. And the uh, other one is uh, the trillion is uh, four sets of zeros three noughts, commas, etc. And it goes up the next one, I think would probably be a quadrillion, just another three zeros and a comma. Uh, so anyway, four trillion a day, the forex in about 21, 10, 2010. Uh, now, uh, all this business, oh yeah, and of course, um, when the euro uh, came in, the induction of the euro, um, I think the interest rates in all the southern uh, European countries uh, were bashed up by suddenly, massively, I think, I'm not actually sure about that, I'd love to know if I'm wrong, uh, by the credit rating agencies in New York that decide on the, the credit ratings. And of course it's had a massive effect on these southern European economies. And then in 2016 we had this Brexit vote. Now around here, before Brexit, I think before Brexit was even mentioned, I was wittering on about uh, currency dealing. In fact, I wittered on to it for about two or three days back in 1993. Uh, but then I re-started re wittering and wrote a rock song about it, uh, all with bubbles and zeros in it and everything. And my basic theory in the rock song, if you see it, uh, is that um, actually these people think they're getting richer, but they're not. They're actually getting poorer and they're making everybody else poorer as well. However, if we got rid of it, like in the 1950s and 60s, then everybody would be getting ri richer, wouldn't they? Because uh, without, um, in my opinion, back here, without Breton words, we would still be living in our uh, bombed out Europe and playing guitars with only one string like they were back in the 1930s. So there would be no Elvis as far as loads of money were is concerned at all. And there we have the Brexit list. Uh, 800 billion, billion uh, in 2016 as well um, dollars United States dollars, not the United States, sorry, please don't think that. Uh, it's, these are US dollars, okay? Attacking the Chinese renminbi. Saw us in one Now that isn't anywhere on Wikipedia that I can see, but it was on the fin in the Financial Times. That's 850 billion, that's 850,000 million. Um, and uh, that's fi Financial Times, I think. And uh, that works out roughly 850 billion. I think it works out, if you divide that by 10 billion, that's about 10, that's about $85 uh, each for about 10 billion people. So you can see there is quite a lot of investment that is in gambling. And then we come on, just a quick thing here, we just have to talk about um, gambling. And we can see in relation to currencies, productive economy. So in times of bad news, can be, uh, uh, cash can be sucked out of the productive economy and to speculative, especially as Forex is not related to products, simply to movement of currencies. So in other words, you know, um, uh, uh, that is a, not uh, bad. Uh, two, uh, to reduce risk factors, most exporters prefer for long-term planning, stable currencies. Yeah, uh, well, here, this is what gives people the jobs, uh, the productive economy, not the gambling economy. Production requires stability, volatility requires speculation. Um, uh, so they are actually opposites in some ways. And I would actually say the productive is actually capitalism, whether it's in a communist state or whether it's in a fascist state, the, the, the politics are irrelevant production is capitalist in some ways or at least you know because it produces things and makes money while the 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 speculative is actually more destructive perhaps than a very sort of nice easygoing socialist or communist society uh, or easygoing sort of fascist society if there could be one <laughs> uh, uh, because uh, this is actually completely anti-production Okay, 
and here we've got again some figures that I had before 800 uh, 4x um, uh, anyway, oh, I'm sorry, uh, 4x uh, right is it still against international law? any large movements of currency detrimental to the world economy should be thing. and then here we have and then I think it's also, also sort of worth mentioning that I think really there is the, um, the uh, general sort of thing that people sort of expect a fair day's work for a fair day's pay. Now, if a gardener comes around and he lays your lawn or does something like that, you know, he can actually go to prison if he doesn't provide a service that is actually worth the money. Now, this doesn't seem to apply. So, you know, and they get all this shock horror. You, know, you, get, you, you get, what is it? You, 